The Eternal Repose video series is a controversial topic subject to conjecture and debate. The opinions shared in these episodes are not the official doctrines of the Christian Church, but are my own opinions developed through research and thoughtful contemplation. For thousands of years, philosophers and theologians from different religions and cultures have wrestled with the transcendent concept of an eternal God who is the creator of all time and space. The idea of a monotheistic God predates Christianity by nearly 1500 years and the earliest form of Judaism by nearly 500 years. From the Chinese worship of Shangdai in the 15th century BC to the Egyptian worship of Aten in the 14th century BC, then to Zoroastrianism of the late second millennium BC from Persia and finally to Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. All these religions have a unique mixture of the oneness of God and His eternal quality. God is eternal. This one philosophical idea has frustrated and confused the greatest of philosophers and theologians throughout recorded human history. Into this quagmire I venture with my simple mind. I do not profess to have clear and concise insight into the transcendence of God. This video is a simple expression of the thoughts that torment my quiet time with him as I look through a glass darkly. The thoughts presented in this video series are based upon my deep Christian faith and my love of history and the Bible. The question that continually comes to the surface of my contemplation is, how does an eternal God calculate time? Eternity is the sticking point. How does the dictionary define eternity? Eternity is an infinite or unending time and a state to which time has no application or meaning. The mystical idea of being eternal can challenge the human mind. Everything we see has a beginning and will have an end. We function within the space-time continuum of our universe. According to physics, even our universe had an explosive beginning that is called the Big Bang Theory, a prevailing cosmological model that the universe came into existence from a large-scale explosion emanating from a point in time known as a singularity. The theory concludes that the universe is expanding outward from the singularity at a calculated rate of speed. Modern measurements place this event at 13.8 billion years ago. In 2014, physicists found a gravitational wave 
rippling outward from the theorized center of the singularity. According to these researchers, this is direct proof, the smoking gun of the theory of inflation and the Big Bang. Is this perceived wave proof of the Big Bang theory? That is a debate reserved for theoretical physicists. Why did I bring up this theory of our universe? The answer is simple. All things in our universe have a beginning and will have an end. In simple terms, the universe is not eternal. Since the universe is not eternal, then how is space and time measured? In physics, there is a mathematical theory known as the space-time continuum that is based upon a Euclidean perspective of space. Euclid, a 4th century BC mathematician from Alexandria, Egypt, envisioned a three-dimensional concept of space that consisted of height, width, and depth. But the space-time mathematical model also factors in a fourth dimension of time. According to physics, time is defined by its measurement. Both Galileo and Newton, and most physicists up until the 20th century, thought that time progressed at the same rate for everyone, everywhere. But this constant would change with Einstein's theory of relativity. Einstein theorized that time progressed differently depending on relative motion. These great minds of history might see the passing of time in different ways, but time is still passing. The cosmology of the universe is still passing along a chronological timeline of events from the ancient past to the distant future. In simple terms, our universe consists of a timeline of events that includes past, present, and future. This is important because in our mortal existence, we have a beginning and an end. This thing called life has its place in the cosmology of the universe. It is hard for us to visualize the transcendent concept of eternity because we are living souls walking along our own version of the universal timeline. How does an eternal God see time? In God, there is no concept of time and space as we know it. To God, there is only the now. There is no past, present, or future. There is no time. God does not run along a timeline. He is not bound by our space-time continuum. God sees and loves all points in space and time at one moment. The first philosopher to postulate this idea was Bothius in the 6th century AD from Rome. He wrote that even if time has no beginning or end, it is not eternal, because time does not have the ability to embrace all time in one moment. Only God has this unique ability, therefore God is eternal. Bothius called his theory 
totum simul, Latin for everything at the same time. Endlessness is the perpetual moving forward along this timeline. But endlessness is not eternal. Eternity comprises all space and time in one moment. Immortality and endlessness cannot do this. Again, only God has the ability to embrace all space and time in one moment. Pantheism is the philosophy and religious belief that does not see God in this light. Pantheism teaches that the universe and God are identical and that everything composes an all-encompassing eminent God. Pantheists do not believe in an instinctive personal God but in an animating force found in all nature. Baruch Spinoza, a 17th century philosopher, was the first to propose this idea in the West. He described God as a unity of all substance in his book, Ethics. The oldest known Religious texts that teach a pantheistic idea is found among the Hindu religion. This religious system teaches that Brahman is the unknown reality of everything. The Upanishads of Hinduism teach in the great sayings that the whole universe is Brahman, from Brahman to a clod of earth. Taoism is another Eastern religion that is pantheistic in nature. The Tao Te Ching never speaks of a transcendent God, but of a mysterious and metaphysical force known as Tao that underlines all things. This philosophical religious system believes that there is nowhere it is not. There is not a single thing without Tao. Welcome to the midi Calorians of the Force in the Star Wars franchise. Many nature-centered folk religions centered in Africa and the Native American religions of the Western Hemisphere have a form of pantheism mixed with polytheism, a belief in more than one god, and animism, which is a belief that animals, plants, and inanimate objects possess a spiritual essence. In some regards, the more radical elements of the environmental movement is pantheistic in nature. The Gaia, Mother Earth concept, found in worldwide environmentalism is distinctively pantheistic and part of the New Age religious system of today. Paganism is a polytheistic religion practiced by ethnic groups throughout history. Most noted for their paganistic beliefs were the ancient Greeks and Romans. Paganism is a naturalistic form of pantheism that worships numerous gods and goddesses that inhabit the elements of nature. Why should we even care about paganism in our discussion about an eternal God? The answer can be found in the fact that paganism was the chief rival of the monotheistic religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. When I consider these facts, 
I am troubled by the inherent weakness of this system. How could an eternal God exist in and comprise a finite universe? The monotheistic religions generally maintain a panentheistic view of God and the universe. Panentheism teaches that God is outside of the universe and it was created by Him. The universe is a manifestation of God and He is the eternal animating force that maintains the universe. Panentheism is an ancient Greek word that is translated all in God. And this theory maintains a distinction between the divine creator and the non-divine created. God and the universe are not ontologically equivalent. God might be viewed as the soul of the universe, but the universe is not God, in so much as the created is not the creator. Again, the universe is nothing more than the manifestation of God in glory and majesty. The author of the book of Hebrews made this point clear in his opening verses of chapter 1. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. The author of Hebrews wanted his readers to understand that Jesus Christ, God's appointed heir, made the universe and sustains it with the power and glory of His eternal Word. These verses teach that God did not come into existence with the Big Bang, but God transcends the singularity that created our space-time continuum. The singularity was created by God through the power of His spoken Word. Only an eternal God could create a universe and put it in motion with space and time. When God created, He created space and time. Before this action of creation, there was no time. All that existed was God and eternity. The opening verses of the Gospel of John support the revelation that God created all things through the power of His spoken Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life and that life was the light of men. The light shines in darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. The opening verses of the book of Genesis also describe God creating the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. 
in the beginning, God created the singularity, and a big bang occurred. Since God pre-existed the singularity, then God is not subject to our space-time restrictions. God does not have a timeline. He is not subject to space and time as we know it. God is eternal, and we mortals are not. The author of Hebrews emphasized that all things are maintained by the power of the spoken word of Jesus Christ. This is a profound truth. According to the laws of physics, all the universe is controlled and held together by the four fundamental interactions of nature, known as the strong force, the weak force, gravity, and the electromagnetic force. In the mid-1960s, attempts were made by physicists to reconcile electromagnetism with the weak force. Every theory that attempted to reconcile this physics problem came short of uniting the two forces. In 1964, Peter Higgs and six other physicists postulated the existence of a subatomic particle that binds the fundamental forces together. This particle was just a theory until July 4th of 2012, when the Large Hadron Collider near Geneva, Switzerland confirmed the existence of Higgs' theoretical particle. Today, this particle is called the Higgs boson, or the Higgs particle, in the standard model of particle physics. Why is this discovery important? The Higgs boson has acquired the nickname of the God particle because it is viewed as the binding agent of the universe. Just a thought, is it possible that science has documented the subatomic world of God's spoken word? The opening chapters of the book of Genesis are often viewed as myth with no basis in historical fact. The creation of Adam and Eve, a garden of Eden, a tree of life, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Come on, people. Clearly, these narratives are myth, with no basis in our space-time continuum. Or are they? On the surface, these descriptions seem strange. In fact, they do seem mythical. I understand how our secular critics could view the Eden narrative as a myth similar to other Sumerian myths, such as the Epic of Gilgamesh. Should the Genesis narrative be only a description of a physical location situated somewhere in present-day Iraq, then our critics might be right. Let's not limit our thinking to such a one-dimensional view. What if the Eden narrative is not describing a one-dimensional experience between God and Adam? but describing a two-dimensional experience. This is a controversial idea. Could there be more than one physical dimension? Dr. Stephen Hawking 
the great theoretical physicist, supports such a theory. This multiple dimensional hypothesis is called string theory. One of the theoretical foundations of this theory is the belief in extra dimensions that run parallel with our physical world. Some physicists who support this hypothesis project that the universe contains as much as 26 space-time dimensions for the bosonic string and 10 dimensions for the superstring. When God spoke, a singularity exploded in a big bang, and a new heaven and a new earth, a new dimension was created with a new space-time continuum to hold God's creation. The explosion of the Big Bang brought into existence our universe with its space-time continuum. Our universe had a beginning. Is it possible that it will also have an end? What would be necessary for our universe to end? Our end will come with a new beginning. Isaiah the prophet, John the revelator, and the apostle Peter all describe this event through their prophetic revelation. Let's read. Isaiah wrote, Behold, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. And he also said, And the new heavens and the new earth that I will make will endure before me, declares the Lord so will your name and descendants endure. Peter followed Isaiah when he wrote, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth the home of righteousness. John also wrote about the coming of a new heaven and a new earth. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. These men of God witnessed something through the revelation of the Holy Spirit. They all described the creation of a new heaven and a new earth with a blast of fervent heat and fire that consumes the old universe. What would it take for the universe to be consumed in such a blast of heat and fire? There can be only one logical answer. A new singularity. A new Big Bang. These prophets seem to describe this very thing. They seem to describe the birth of a new dimension with a new universe and a new space-time continuum. 
Peter referred to this new heaven and new earth as the home of righteousness. While John saw New Jerusalem occupying a central place in this new dimension. The truth is, no one knows for sure what events these three prophets described, nor do we truly understand what is implied by the creation of a new heaven and a new earth. But in the center of all this dimensional theory dwells an eternal God who is not bound by time and space. I am not a theoretical physicist, nor am I a theologian. I know that these thoughts are controversial and argumentative, but these are the thoughts that capture my imagination. When I look up into the starry night skies, it seems I'm looking into the face of God. As I said before, God is eternal. There is no concept of time and space as we know it to Him. To God, there is only the now. There is no past, present, or future. There is no time. So, when we read in 2 Peter that a day to the Lord is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day, we err in our understanding of God to think that He exists within His own version of time and space. Let's read. But, do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. Peter never said that one day in the space-time continuum of God is the equivalent of one thousand years along our universal timeline. Peter was using hyperbole to describe the eternal quality of God. When we ponder the concepts of heaven and hell, we cannot ignore their eternal quality because our God is an eternal God.